It is the 30th anniversary of People to the American Way. You honor me for having had something to do with it and a reasonable amount to do with keeping it relevant and effective. You raise this evening alone over a million and a half dollars. <laughs> just, just honoring Alec and me. And you pay me all of these great words and the additional honor of allowing me to close the evening that celebrates all of that. But please, don't for a second be concerned whether this is all too much for me. <laughs> I, I can take it. <laughs> that probably comes as a consequence of my age. I do get a kick out of my age. Just getting out of a chair and crossing the room gets me applause now. <laughs> and I can't believe how wise I've become. A, a simple good morning is thought to hold deep meaning. <laughs> now, if, if any of you are thinking that at my age a fellow may believe he's earned the right to feel that way, I want to tell you that if I lived to be 99, 109, I wouldn't feel I earned it. And I have my mother to thank for that. <laughs> many, many years ago, she visited us in Los Angeles for a couple of weeks. Actually, I sent a car to uh, Connecticut to drive her to JFK. I met her uh, with a wheelchair at the curb. I pushed her up to the plane myself, brought her to LA first class. And when I tell you we did everything, I mean we did everything to show her a good time. We took her to a couple of previews we might not have gone to and to a few dinner parties, introduced her to all the Carol O'Connors, B. Arthurs, all the Reiners and Mel Brookses of my life. We took her to a cocktail party to meet Walter Matha and Gregory Peck, brought her to a book signing for Groucho Marx, screened a film for her where she met Paul Newman, we did everything we could to show her a good time. When her, when her visit was concluded and I was driving her to the airport for her flight home, first class, she said to me, Norman, sweetheart, when I get home to Bridgeport and you talk to someone back there, if you hear that I told a little white lie, you should, I don't want you to be upset. So why, I asked. She said, well, a little white lie, what does it matter? I, Mother, what little white lie might you be telling? Oh, well, it doesn't, just remember, you're talking to your sister, your cousin Esther, and you hear, Mother, I begged. What are you talking about? Why would you have to tell a little white lie? And she said, who has to know that I didn't get to Las Vegas? Swear to God. <laughs> Many of you heard the story before, but she gets such a great reception, I'll tell it again. One morning, when I learned that the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences was starting a Hall of Fame, and I would be among its first inductees, along with Bill Paley, General Sarnoff, Patty Chayefsky, Edward R. Murrow, Lucille Ball, Milton Berle, and me. I called her immediately at Bridgeport, and I told her. And she said, listen, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say? <laughs> would, would you believe I have 75 years of those stories? But I can't believe it has been 30 years since I was startled by the proliferation of TV evangelicals across radio and television. Jerry Falwell, Jimmy Swaggart, Paul Robeson, Pat Robertson, among others, mixing politics and religion and reminding me, when I was nine and 10 years old, of listening to Father Coughlin on the radio, ranting against Franklin Roosevelt, liberals, the New Deal, and in his case, Jews. 
I decided to take them all on with a film and started writing a script I called Religion, hoping to savage those TV ministries much the way Patty Chayefsky savaged the networks. And then one morning, I'm watching the Reverend Jimmy Swagger, and I see him ask his viewers, his TV congregation, to pray for the removal of a Supreme Court justice. And it scared the hell out of me. I couldn't wait the two or more years it would take to write uh, and make a, or write a script, make a film. So I made that TV spot you saw a bit earlier the, of the blue collar worker. I paid to run it on a TV station, a local TV station in DC. And it caused so much talk that all three networks, there were only three at the time, ran it on their 7 o'clock news. And like an act of spontaneous combustion, People for the American Way was born. From that day to this, I haven't awakened and read my newspapers any morning when I didn't thank God that People for was there. I take great comfort knowing we have active members and supporters in 50 states, activists who wish for everyone the freedom to read any book or movie of their choice, or see any movie of their choice, create or appreciate even the most challenging art, people who believe the government has no business telling us who or how to love, members and supporters who truly believe in equal justice and equal opportunity under the law, who appreciate to their toes the blessings of an independent judiciary and who couldn't appreciate more that wonderful DC staff in, 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 in our headquarters who are the professional people for the American way, the ones who fight for these principles day in and day out, 24-7. For the 30 years people for the American way, now under the leadership of that lovely gentleman you saw earlier, the indefatigable Michael Keegan, provided... <laughs> They provided much of the eternal vigilance that the protection of our civil rights and of liberties required. Our government, no matter the party, no matter the party in power, it aches me to say, was of no help in this regard. Often quite the contrary. For example, 30 years ago, we had something called the Fairness Doctrine. The Fairness Doctrine, enforced by the FCC and it held that the media provides balance and obje objectivity in its news and discussion shows. So, for example, when People for the American Way saw Pat Robertson espousing only one point of view on a political matter and on a religious broadcast at that, we notified the FCC and that ministry, sometimes the entire Christian Broadcasting Network, was forced to provide us with equal time to respond. Doesn't that sound right? Fair and balanced news reporting? <laughs> Where have we heard that before? People for used the Fairness Doctrine so effectively until it was repealed in 1987. On May 13, 1982, I received this letter from Pat, the Reverend Pat Robertson, president of the Christian Broadcasting Network. He wrote, Dear Norman, last week your organization challenged our program on KTLA in Los Angeles, and yesterday the sales manager of KTLA called our headquarters and said, <coughs> quote, if you discuss anything political on your program next week, we will take it off the air. Norman, you are not merely trying to silence a member of the press. You are trying to silence a prophet of God. I warn you with all solemnity, Norman, your arms are too short to box with God. The suppression of the voice of God's servant is a terrible thing. God himself will fight for me against you, and he will win. I remain yours sincerely, Pat Robertson. <laughs> Unfortunately, too many of us on the left, to the left of center, tend to laugh at such as this. I am chilled by it. 
with good reason, because once, on October 1st, 1981, hundreds of thousands of people across the country belonging to the moral majority received these words in a newsletter from Jerry Falwell. Dear friends, I am about to name the man that some people believe to be the greatest threat to the American family in our generation, Norman Lear. He went on to talk about the filth and sexual perversion that my shows brought into America's living rooms, but calling me the greatest threat to the American family earned me some hate mail and death threats, one so threatening that my family and partners insisted I secure protection. This religiously stoked hatred threatens humanity everywhere across the globe today, and it is very alive in our America as well, and most threatening when it comes with a partisan political tinge. People for the American Way have stood as a bulwark against that in the press, in the media, and by example. When we produced a two-hour special, I Love Liberty, years ago, our co-chairs were Gerald Ford and Lady Bird Johnson. On the stage, we had Barry Goldwater, John Wayne, and Jane Fonda, all contributing to the idea that fight as we may over policy and ideology, we stand united when it comes to basic American principles. We continue to work toward that end today. Six weeks ago, my people for the American Way credentials quite intact, I accepted an invitation to accompany Nancy Reagan to the Republican debate at the Reagan Library. Her husband, with whom I had a friendly, however contentious, relationship, would have been happy to see me there, I know. That civility, is so unlike anything we hear from the Republican candidates as they battle each other. Newt Gingrich, like the others, cloaks everything he says in a kind of bumper sticker religiosity. We, on the left, have ceded the God and values talk to the right, and I think it's been a big mistake. The what's it all about Alfie questions make for the best conversations going. I consider myself as much a believer, as religious, if you will, as the best guy, as the next guy. But it's my belief system. I have thanked whatever and whoever is responsible for my being alive with every wake up. Virtually every time I've bitten into a ripe peach or looked into my children's eyes or enjoyed a great laugh in a group, I've been grateful, often to the point of tears. I once asked, a great theologian and friend in Vermont, to give me the shortest definition he could of worship. He gave it to me in one word, gratitude. You don't agree with that? No problem, as long as you don't decry it. If, you worship, if worship for you means going to a church or a synagogue or a mosque, reading from a specific sacred text, wonderful. Or if you choose not to believe, Wonderful. I offered my life in a war for you to believe whatever you may do, whatever you do. But it is also... <laughs> thank you. But it is also my view that we humans and our faith systems are so gloriously complex that you can take any amount of people sitting in the same pews, knee to knee, every Sunday of their lives, reading and praying from the same sacred text. And like no two snowflakes, like no two thumbprints, no two compacts with the Almighty will be the same. The way we think and feel and relate to the deity is unique to each of us. Our founders clearly understood that there'd be a level of separation between church and state. I just been trying to build a wall of understanding, of common sense to go along with the notion that it's a poor idea to mix politics and religion, and a good idea to back that caution with laws that make that very clear. For 30 years, I've brought my perspective to People for the American Way and linked arms and minds and spirits with people of all faiths and experiences who have brought their unique perspective 
to the work of the organization. What unites us are the promises and guarantees of our founding documents and the precise language with which they are expressed. The majority of words and phrases like endowed by their creator with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The constitutional guarantee of equal justice under the promise of equal opportunity for all. Then there are the last words of the Declaration of Independence, where the founders pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Sacred honor. It feels antique now, doesn't it? We don't sense much of that today. The last time I came across sacred honor, I was watching The Godfather. <laughs> I want to suggest that we lefties start laying claim to what we see as sacred and serve it up proudly to the religious right, to the James Dobson, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Peck, Beck, Carl Rove, all those hate mongers sheathed in sanctity, and to the Koch brothers, the types that fund them and use them so effectively for their own political power-grabbing purposes. Over the past several decades, the power-grabbing right has built a powerful infrastructure, radio and TV stations and networks. They've built think, ta think tanks, colleges and law schools, and funded political groups that prepped all the way for the Supreme Court in Citizens United to grant corporations the right to provide any amount of financial backing to a candidate or a cause, just like any other average citizen. And all of it carried with an air of holier-than-thou sanctity. No less apparent than Pat Robertson when he told me my arms were too short to box with God. And now, as frightening as it is, where do we find that holier-than-thou sanctity most apparent in politics today? Among the seven candidates attempting to prove in every debate that we have seen that they are the right kind of Christian to be the Republican candidate for the presidency of the United States. In light of the circumstances we liberals and progressives have succumbed to, it is hard to remember that we, not the right, we are the spiritual heirs to those Americans who struggled to end slavery and segregation, to end child labor and win, and win safe conditions and a living wage for workers. And we are the spiritual heirs to those who conceived of and fought for just about every bit of social legislation in the last century. Legislation that everyone left and right now take for granted. And that resulted not until not that many years ago in the most flourishing, hopeful, and empowered middle class in the history of nations. Big change since then. And, and yet, despite being the spiritual heirs to all of that, it is the right that presumes ownership of everything that pertains to God and to the flag. Look into the future. I will rely on people for the American way and its sons and daughters in Young People for and the young elected officials you saw earlier to continue to fight that, for that wall of separation between government and religion. I will rely on them to ensure that equal protection of the law covers all Americans, no matter their race, religion, or sexual orientation. And I will rely on them to claim their share of God and the flag by acknowledging that the God for all believers on the right is the same God for all believers on the left as well. And, and that no one side can lay sole claim to the family values, patriotism, and all the other good stuff that stems from that source. I really wanted to say what I've just said so much tonight. I am so grateful for your attention. 
for the opportunity to speak it to you, for your coming here to celebrate this evening, for Alec and myself. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you.